You're listening to the Farmyard Podcast. This podcast is supported by Farmyard and Farmyard's Mighty Network. Episode 58, and in this episode, I'm speaking with Bill McDormand of the Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance. He has over 14 years of experience with the seed. Boy, you're going to learn a lot today. Well, hello there. This is Linda Borgie from Farmyard, and you, my friends, are just one seed away. And boy, is that tagline so appropriate for this particular episode, because I have on the line Bill McDormand. He is the director of the Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance, and he is going to give us a wealth of information on not only his organization, but on seeds itself, why it is important to to, uh, save seeds, and some information on how we can learn how to collect them. So let's bring him on right now. Are you there, Bill? I am. Hello, and thank you for having me. Thank you so much for spending this time with us, Bill. You know, Bill, if you could just tell our listeners a little bit about you, a little bit about your background. Let's start there. Okay. Well, I'm currently the executive director of a regional seed conservation organization um, known as the Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance. And I've been doing that for four and a half years. Before that, I was the executive director of Native Seed Search in Tucson, Arizona, which is a 40-year-old seed conservation organization. And my wife, Belle, and I were recruited to start a new regional organization for the Rocky Mountain region that was somewhat similar to what um, uh, Native Seed Search has been doing for the last 40 years in the Southwest in Tucson, Arizona. And so um, before that, I owned and ran my own uh, um, small, what I call bioregional seed company, uh, originally based in Ketchum, Idaho. It was known as Seeds Trust High Altitude Gardens. And I specialized in varieties that were really cold, short season adapted. And so um, I've been um, answering questions about seeds and saving seeds um, for a long time. What do you see, Bill, as, as um, you know, the difference between, let's say, 30 years ago and today, just as an example? Well, you know, probably the most striking thing to me, and I talk about this all the time now, is that we have a local food movement. I mean, when I got started, and this was back in the days, you know, Rob Johnson was a good friend of mine. Johnny's had been going a few years, and I, Kent Wheelie who started Seed Savers Exchange, was a few years ahead of me. Forrest Schomer at Abundant Life, another great seed network. All of us got going because of um, disappearing diversity in our, uh, in our uh, food system. Let's, let's, expl- let's explain that uh, in normal terms. Disappearing diversity. Like you go into the stupid market and you can only find like three varieties of lettuce or four four varieties of apples, whereas years ago, there would be a lot more to choose from. Is that not correct? That is exact. That's one really great way of explaining it. And and that sort of loss of diversity was even more amplified in, um, in what farmers had access to as far as seeds. We went from maybe 20,000 small seed companies in the United States down to, well, we have three companies now that own and control more than 60% of the world seeds. It's hard to tell exactly because the statistics are so hard to find. They're, they're not really transparent about this anymore. But since Bear um, purchased Monsanto and Kim China just um, purchased um, Syngenta, you know, they're not even American companies anymore. So, so you know, there's some really great statistics that have come out. Um, the United Nations uh, Food and Agriculture Organization did a study in 1990 reporting that maybe 90% of the diversity that farmers had access to was gone. This is farmers worldwide in their farms. 90%. little frightening. Correct. And why is that important? It's because we are now facing unprecedented changes in our environment. And new diseases are coming about, new insects and pest you know, invasions and 
And we need diversity to make sure that we have varieties that will withstand these things that we don't, that are just now being uncovered. That's how good farming's always worked. People always had a diversity of things planted just in case, just in case there's a drought, just in case there's a flood, just in case the Mormon crickets come in or whatever. There were, there was always something that would survive. And so when you reduce your diversity, you actually reduce your ability in your food system to survive. And so these two sorts of things are coming together. You know, industrialization needed to get rid of all the diversity to make better profits. They don't want to take care of, you know, hundreds of thousands of different varieties. They just want to sell the thing that works, but, but that brings them the most money. And so they've been moving on that vector for 40 or 50 years. And now with climate change, especially, you know, the, the environment's waking up and said, no, 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 you guys better have as much diversity as you can if you want your food systems to avoid collapse. And so that's sort of, you know, what's going on around diversity. And so... So, you know, I got started to try to save diversity, you know, when I started my small little company, because that's really, you know, what we'll do it is to, it's not a new idea. It's not something that we need to invent. We just need to go back a generation or two to the beautiful web that we have where every little um, cultural as well as ecological niche in this country had its own seeds and had its own varieties of things adapted to that particular place. And so it just seems like a natural thing to wake that back up and get that going again, using the 10% that we had, that we still have left. And it's more than that actually probably has been hidden in jars and cans. I think we've, the baby boomers especially have have proven that, that there's a lot of stuff still out there. It's just not in circulation anymore. So it's up to us and our own new seed saver exchange type networks to find that stuff, grow it, take care of it again, um, tell stories about it, start seed libraries, start seed exchanges again, and get that stuff back out amongst ourselves. And so that's really what I'm trying to work on. That's what the Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance is about. You you mentioned you mentioned stories and one story just comes to mind the mortgage lifter tomato. Oh yeah. Right? I mean yeah. he paid off his mortgage. Yeah. By growing this one tomato. I mean, so th- there are an awful lot of stories that are connected with seed seeds. Now, what is the definition of an heirloom variety? That's a good question for people just getting started. And this gets back to your, you know, your original question about what's different now. We have local food. We have, you know, we can go down to a farmer's market and we're starting to um, see farmers that have heirloom varieties in them. And so what are those? Well, those are, in my mind, those are treasures. You know, there have been some, you know, as as we come out of industrial agriculture and what I would call our overly left-lobed minds, you know, where we want to categorize everything and we want to make sure everything is, is, is straight on ledgers and spreadsheets, you know, we immediately want to know what the definition of heirloom is. And so, you know, I, sometimes I laugh when I read definitions that say, oh, well, it has to be at least 50 years old or 30 years old. Or, you know, the fact is there are no seed naming police out there. Nobody's going to come and get you if you call something heirloom. and But the heart of what an heirloom is, is that it's a treasure. It was treasured. We know that about, about furniture. We know that about uh, pottery. We know that's, those, that's where the word heirloom comes from. And so as we apply that to seeds, let's keep that part of it. It's a real treasure. And in my own mind, it doesn't matter how long it's been around. As Don Tipping at Siskiyou Seeds out in Williams, Oregon says, our job now is to create the heirlooms of the future. We're rediscovering this whole thing. We can take care of ourselves. We can actually have better varieties of things because they're adapted to where we are. We can take care of more diversity ourselves in our small little areas. In fact, that's the only way uh, collectively as a society we can take care of diversity. And part of that then are saving the seeds to the new things that we find that we really want to. Well, we're going to only save the seeds to the things that are our treasures. Right. That's why we save them. We go, oh, my God, we can't let this go. This is our treasure. So that's what an heirloom is to me. And we're starting to see those starting to appear 
you know, in our farmers markets and our CSAs. And that's really a beautiful thing. The, if, if I could just interject here, our mission at the Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance now is, is um, to get all of those people that are part of the local food movement to understand that almost all of the seeds, you know, aside from a few heirloom treasures that you'll see here and there, all of those seeds are being grown somewhere else. They're from outside our regions. And many of those that come from our favorite catalogs, even our certified organic seed catalogs, are coming from overseas or even being contracted and grown in China. And so at the same time, we're thinking about local food being sustainable and resilient. Man, how sustainable is that if you don't have any seeds for it? And so it's really easy for us to talk to people now about what we're doing. We say we're trying to bring local seeds into local food. That is so wonderful. I think it's just fabulous. And it's necessary because I want our listeners to, to be fully aware that if we don't grow it, it becomes extinct. Yeah, there's nobody else going to take care of our seeds. There's nobody coming. There's no institution that's being paid. All of the world's seed banks are underfunded. You know, they're being back. You know, they're targets sometimes now in war. They're definitely being targets of storms. You know, we lost a, a seed bank in the Philippines. So there's, you know, there's just the only people that can take care of this stuff are ourselves. And so, you know, even, you know, I, as we started the Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance, we traveled around the West through summer to a lot of farmers markets and everywhere I went, I would ask the farmers where they get their seeds. And they answered, there are three big answers. There are lots of answers, but the three that came out most were Johnny's selected seeds, high mowing seeds and territorial seeds. Right. And they're really great companies and they sell a lot of organic things. And, you know, I know a lot of those people, as I said earlier, Rob Johnson who started Johnny's is a good friend of mine. However, those companies are getting big. You know, and their aims are to keep to be profitable and they need to be. I don't blame them for that. However, when I got the new Johnny's catalog, I looked in the catalog in this le this last year, this new Johnny Selected Seed catalog. Uh, I was shocked to find that 40 percent of the lettuce varieties in the catalog and many of these are certified organic seeds. Forty percent are have utility patents on them. 40%. That's up from 23% last year. Can you can you explain what a utility patent is? A utility patent is the most restrictive form of intellectual property protection on the planet. Okay? And it is only relatively recently being applied to uh, seed producing plants. We never allowed that. The whole history of this country, in fact, the whole history of agriculture for 10,000 years and the whole history, you know, of the modern agriculture has never allowed somebody to actually own outright a seed producing plant and its seeds the way they would own new software or they would own a new technical invention. But now we allow that because of some uh, relatively recent court cases. And, and we teach this stuff in seed school. There's some of this in seed school online. So I won't go into that really deeply. But what it means is that for the first time in human history, and these are certified organic seeds. These are open pollinated varieties. These are varieties that are the easiest to save seeds from, lettuces. It's one of the five that we teach everybody how to see, save. For the first time, it is illegal for you to even allow that plant to go to seed in your garden, let alone to save and use your own seeds. Well, I see a world, you know, uh, somewhere in the near future that each town has a seed library where, you know, all of the people in the town that are growing that are saving seeds can go and deposit them. I mean, that is self-reliance. I mean, here on the East Coast, I mean, what is it? 80% of our food, organic as well, is coming from California. And folks, I don't know if you've noticed, not only is it on fire, but there isn't a drop of water in California. They're actually watering crops with fracking wastewater. Now that's 3,000 miles away. So if that food chain gets broken, what happens? Are we going to starve? So we really have to wake up to what is in. 
our future. Well, this seems like a great place to take a little break so we can hear from our sponsor. Hello, everyone. This is Linda Borgie, the founder of Farmyard. You know, not sure if you are aware that the reason why I formed a mighty movement called Farmyard was to grow healthy people. And you know, there's an awful lot of topics involved in growing healthy people. We have to grow healthy soil to grow nutrient dense plants, and then we'll grow healthy people. But you know, what we were missing was a mighty network to connect the dots. And we have created a mighty network just for that purpose. We are inviting you in to come and look around, check out our topics, growing soil, water, harvesting seeds, tools, And not only that, other than myself, there is more than a dozen individuals that are going to be sharing their expertise with you, like my friends all over the world in the energy of Oregon. So come on in and check it out. I know you'll love it. And I will see you on the inside. Until then, go farm your yard. Well, we are back with Bill McDormand from Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance. And I really want to talk about the seed school, especially the online seed saving course. Tell us more about this, Bill. Well, you know, after um, the reason I started my little bioregional seed company, you know, the first one was a nonprofit I started, helped start in uh, Missoula, Montana. We were talking about their Garden City Seeds that officially got going in 1981. And then in 1984, I moved home and started another little bioregional seed company. And the definition of that for me was that we would teach our customers to save their own seeds. Our job as a seed company wasn't to supply your seeds every year. Our job was to find things that would work for you in our cold, short mountain climates and that you would then learn to save the seeds from them so that we would all strengthen our area together. And so um, after answering phone calls, you know, uh, this got started before the internet. And then we had fax machines. People would fax me questions and uh, f- uh, for years and years. And then we finally got the internet and I started answering questions that way. Boy, I had a lot. I had a pretty good idea of what kinds of things people needed to know first about how to save seeds. So I woke up um, one day in uh, 2000 and 10. Well, actually, it was in the middle of the night, and I sat up on my bed, and I go, oh, my God, seed school. We should start teaching this stuff. And I don't know why it took me so long to think about just organizing the whole thing into an actual school to make sure that more and more people could get to this. I mean, because in some ways, I've been teaching it you know, nonstop for 30 years, but that was the idea that I could be finally be a resource like the one that could have helped me when I got started, you know, almost 40 years before. There was nobody home. The, all the companies had gotten so big, and there were a few of us small companies, but there was nobody to show us what to do really or nobody to answer our questions as we got back into this. So the idea was, wow, let's do a one-stop shop. And the original seed school was 10 days. We shortened that to six days. And we've done, I don't know, 30 of those in the last eight years. Um All over, even in the Philippines, we were pulled to go to the Philippines. You know, we've been to Hampshire College, University of Montana. We just got back from Sterling College in Vermont where we did a six-day seed school. Um, We've been pulled to do seed schools in a day where we come in and we try to concentrate everything down into a day, which was a really good ep- you know, exercise for us because it made us focus on what's most important. And we did a bunch of those. We've now graduated over 1,000 people to those, those uh, programs. And then we started seed school teacher training. And um, by the end of our, the course that we're doing in October at the Posner Center in Denver, um, we will have graduated over 100 seed school teachers to teach what – to teach people how to do their own seed schools, all right? So this is how we're going to exponentially increase this whole thing. And out of that then came a seed school online, which was a real challenge. How do we take the best of the best of the best of all of these programs and all of their feedback and put it into a form so people can download it online, seven different lectures, and get access to it? So that's really what seed school online is. And it's really a hope you know, that we can use this technology 
and and get this word out because folks, I agree, you know, with you, Linda. Nobody's coming to help, and we are hugely for, uh, vulnerable with our food system, and and if that if the disruptions to our food system, and these are happening all over the world. We have 30 million climate refugees right now. You look at the statistics around uh, around um, sea level rise now, and the way that's accelerating. It won't be too long before we have. 30 million, 300 million, maybe 3 billion climate refugees. And so people all over the world, the smart people are shortening their supply lines. They're learning how to take things, you know, into their own hands again, how to make sure that they're going to be okay. Um, Having a seed library in your town, think about it. Think about your food system being disrupted, not just for three days, which is what it would take to empty all the grocery stores in your area, all of them. Nobody has more than a three-day inventory. We've even seen this when hurricanes happen. But what happens if it's three weeks or three months or six months? Think about how different your town would be if at the center of all this was a seed library with people who are going, okay, calm down, folks. It's okay. We got seeds for everybody. These are varieties we've grown. They're adapted to here. We can start passing them out. We're going to organize courses to show you how to do it. We can have greens for you in 10 days. We can have salad greens, you know, in 30 days. Nobody's going to starve. We're going to take care of each other. Imagine that and not having that. It's outrageous. It's really incredible. It's really incredible uh, the work that you're doing. Now, with the Seed School, that's all online. Is there a way that the students would be able to ask questions? Is there any interactiveness within it? Yes. Yes. So once a month um, through my friend Greg Peterson at the Urban Farm University, and you can find this online, you can go to the Rocky Mountain Seeds.org website because we post notices about it the next one again but once a month greg and i come on live it is sort of a seed school online once a month live where you can come on and ask all your questions and so we and you know we'll spend an hour talking we usually take one subject like the plat patenting you know that we just talked about utility patents or whatever and we'll go through that a bit for a few minutes and then we'll take your question doesn't matter what question you have i love specific yard and life specific questions, because that's really where the rubber meets the road. Those are the most important things that ever happen is what's happening in your life, in your yard. And so we love to answer questions about that. And, and, you know, we don't know all the answers. I mean, Greg has been running the urban farm in Phoenix for almost 30 years and teaching permaculture, you know, and, and, and getting feedback from people. And as I said, I've been doing answering C questions for a long time, you know, and we get asked questions that we don't know the answers to, but it's really rare now that we don't know where to send you or who to talk to, to find it. So yeah, we had a a really kind of technical genetic question asked on one of the past shows. And I um, thought I had heard or seen the name earlier of somebody who was on the show, um, Joseph Lofthouse who had come to one of our seed schools. And Joseph's probably the only guy I've ever seen at one of our seed schools that actually answered all of the questions. He's just this brilliant plant breeder. He lives by himself, 5,000 feet in Utah, and and um, does this phenomenal um, plant breeding of new heirloom treasures. That's just the way to say it. Well, I knew Joseph was on on the podcast, on this live, you know, hour-long podcast webinar. And so I said, Joseph, if you're on and you heard this question, answer it, buddy. You can type in the answer. And we'll we'll get you on. And if, sure enough, there he was. You know, and for for me, that's it. That's the genius of the team. Nobody's going to solve this for us. We have to do it together. The only way to create the diversity we're going to need is to do it in each individual backyard. It's got to be small individual gardeners. We get a million new people growing and saving seeds in their backyards, making all the mistakes they're going to make. We know that, you know, making all the mistakes all gardeners have always made. Yeah, that we're just going to learn to take advantage of that now by saving the seeds. You know, that's the only way we create new diversity. And the more people we get doing that, the more diversity we have. That's a biological truth. No seed conservation organization from the top down can save that much diversity. Nobody has the money. Trust me. 
I've been involved in this now for long enough to look out. I've met people all over the world. I met Curry. You know, Curry Fowler was one of the people that originally uh, inspired me. Curry's the guy who started the Global Crop Diversity Trust. It was his idea to do the Svalbard Doomsday Seed Vault. They don't have enough money. They're trying to raise money now in a in a uh, trust to e- just to keep the lights turned on. And you know, and they keep raising the amount. You know, and so that's okay. You know, Matt, that was a good idea to save everything. We were losing it. You know, people knew we were going to lose 90%. Let's scurry around. Let's get it all into seed banks. Now we're waking up and realizing we can't afford to keep them and that the banks themselves are targets. So let's just, I have an answer. I have a suggestion. Let's just go back and do the way we've always done it for 10,000 years where everybody everywhere does a little bit of it. And the diversity is naturally embedded deeply in each of our valleys and our communities and our cultures. And the stories teach us not only what to save and how to save it, but how to take care of ourselves again. The way Rowan White so eloquently talks about in her Seed Saver program. You know, the, some of the original Native American stories about how to take care of seeds included stories about how to take care of your children and raise them. This is all connected, folks, and it's so beautiful that we didn't lose all this. We're only a generation or two out. We can find the, the elders, and we can hook back in, and we can find their seeds. That should be our number one job now, and celebrate them wherever you are, and then share them. If you don't have a seed exchange in your town or a seed library, start one. Go to seedlibraries.net. There's a little button there that says how to start your own seed library. Rebecca Newburn, bless her heart, has um, maybe been responsible with that one button for starting 300 seed libraries in the United States in the last eight years. We're doing this. We're waking up. We, this is so exciting to be a part of. It just gives us hope, you know. Well, I feel like, you know, all my life has been like a rehearsal, and now it's showtime. <laughs> Right, now it's showtime, and let's get on with it. As I had mentioned to you earlier, I mean, my granddaughter, from the age of five, this time of year, we did not go anywhere without little envelopes, and little coin envelopes in our pockets so we could save this seed and save that seed. If we don't teach the children, they cannot be resilient. They cannot understand the process. You see, I hold, especially basil, one seed of basil in the palm of my hand and it's just all inspiring that that tiny little black dot what it's going to become when it's all grown up how does it does do it such intelligence I, I i tell you i am very very connected to the seed and i really would like to see this move quickly Yes. Well, just think that inside that seed, and I love first graders. If you get a chance to light up first graders around seeds, they get it. There's this natural wonder about them, and they, they recognize the amazing potential. But I used to pass out seeds to first graders, and I say, do you realize that inside this seed is packed a million more seeds? In fact, it's unlimited. And it's all hardware and software all packed down inside that little seed. Not only is it going to grow a plant, it's going to grow more seeds. And each one of those is going to grow more. And all of that's packed in that little dark, shiny basil seed, you know? We're so safe in in that area. My granddaughter and I uh, planted some sunflowers, some mammoth Russian sunflowers. And we had one that was 13 feet tall. Oh, my gosh. Oh, I've got to send you a picture of the head. I mean, it it was just ginormo. And I said, you know, and she said, Grandma, look at all the babies she had. Yeah. Look at how many more sunflowers we have here. So now we have put those into little coin envelopes and we're gifting them to people. There you go. That's how you build. That's how you build community. Wow. That's how you built. Yes. We need, we need these collaborative cooperatives. We have directories with maps you can pull up on our site and you can find all the seed stewards 
that have signed up on our site. I think we're almost 300 people now have committed to growing and saving and sharing the seats to at least one variety. And you can see the map and then click on the people that are closest to you and find out who else is doing this. So our network is growing um, peer to peer. We don't even know all the stuff that's going on. People that are sharing information and seeds, most importantly. You know, we're the Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance because we think that in the end, this will end up being regional again. And because it's just easiest for people, you know, that live in one region to share the seeds and the information and the failures with the people right around them. That's what, you know, that's just biological. And so if you don't have a regional seed organization in your area, um, email us. You can get in touch with us through our site and um, we'll help you. We'll tell you how we started ours. You know, I guess my... My vision is that we'll have a national association someday of regional seed conservation organizations that help knit this stuff together and help accelerate this so that we can share not only seeds, but all the information that's necessary for us to do this as quickly as we can. And that's really what we need to be doing. I agree with you totally, Lind Linda. This is wake up call time. This is this if you haven't checked outside, you know, it's and seen smoke or a flood or whatever else it is, man. You know, it's time to yeah, it's time to wake up. So no, this has been a real pleasure being with you. Oh, a real pleasure being with you, Bill, as well. And I will put all of the links in the show notes. And anything that you would like to include in the show notes, please send to me. And I'll make sure the listeners have everything that they need to go forward in saving seed. Well, thank you so much for your time, my dear. This has been such a thrill for me, honestly. I love talking about seeds, and I love talking to people who know about them. Well, thank you. It's been an honor, and hopefully you'll have a have us back someday. Thank you. I sure will. All I right. definitely will. All righty. Take care. Take care. Well, thank you very much for listening. I hope that you enjoyed this episode of Farming Arts Podcast, all about seeds. And if you did enjoy it, please be sure to download, subscribe, and leave us a little comment. That boosts us us up in the ratings and iTunes, and it's really to get the word out. We want to move the information. We want to be able to give you the skill sets necessary to go forward successfully right from the get-go. Well, I will once again catch you on the flip side, and until then, go farm that yard. This podcast is supported by a collaborative cooperative inside of our mighty network. We thank everyone for tuning in. If you enjoy our content, please subscribe 